Good morning, Lakeshore Community Fellowship. I'm Pastor Josiah, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'm excited today that we can get uh, together into the Word. We can praise our God together. We can lift things up in prayer. And I'm also excited to welcome our guest speaker, Pastor Laird Crump of the Campus Church, as we look at the topic of fear or faith. During this time we're in, it's easy to be fearful. And regardless of COVID, there are many things in the world to be scared of, you know, to live in fear. We can see you can easily fall into a trap of living in fear. So what should our response be to the things that uh, bring out a fearful response in us? You know, what should our response be to COVID as Christians? How can we live in faith and not have fear? How can we have faith during a time of fear? And that is the word Pastor Laird will be bringing up this morning. As well as a church leadership, we have been looking over the new rules in Ontario's um, new reopening plan. It might be their fifth reopening plan by now. And it's looking like we will be allowed to have in-person services the first few weeks of July. Um, I don't even think they have a for sure date yet on when we will enter. I guess it's stage two, but we're constantly looking on whenever we're able to meet again in person and we, we will be open as soon as we are able to. Until then, once we enter stage one of the reopening plan, which is looking like it's going to be June 14th, we will be organizing fellowship groups to meet together outside. And these will be safe groups of 10 who will meet outside just to catch up and have fellowship with other members of the church. You know, a lot of you might not have seen each other in a long time. And so this is a great opportunity to catch up to pray together, to have fellowship. So if you would like to be a part of one of these groups, please reach out to me and we can get you organized. We're going to be releasing more official information on them when we know exactly when Ontario is entering phase one. As well, this morning, I just want to prepare our hearts with a passage of scripture before getting into our time of praise. From Psalm 145, it reads, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Please join us for our time of praise. Goes beyond. 
you for that time of praise. And now as a church, we just want to get into a time of prayer.
together. This is where we just lift things up as a church. Um, I send a, a list of things every week in our weekly newsletter, but as well, you know, this is a time for maybe you at home to lift some things you need to lift up as well and to be aware of what we're all petitioning for as a church. First, we want to be praying for our church as we look to reopen our Sunday services. I know we have been praying this prayer for a y- almost a year and a half, and we open and we close, but we're again praying for our church to reopen. As well, we're praying for our fellowship groups as they seek to rebuild fellowship after such a long time in quarantine. We also want to be lifting up Art and Willie Mitchell in prayer as they're hoping to see their son Andrew for Father's Day. Um, As some of you may know, Andrew has been just unable to get out due to the restrictions placed on him and and many of us. We're just praying that Andrew is is allowed out of his home to to see Art and Willie for Father's Day. And again, we want to be constantly lifting up all of the parents who are supporting their children with online education. As I'm sure all parents are aware, uh, schools will not be reopening until the fall. And that can be quite a discouragement for some parents. So we just want to be lifting you up in prayer. And praying for encouragement and strength. Lastly, we want to be praying for our missionaries. Uh, We have a few missionaries who we can't name because of the countries they're in, but one in particular that I want to lift up is John Castles. John Castles is, is, he's involved in an incredibly difficult but incredibly needed ministry of working with women in human trafficking. Um, This can often be a heartbreaking ministry as sometimes you know, the, the way things end are, are not that great. And just recently, a woman John Castles had been trying to work with um, had passed away, uh, you know, I, I believe was murdered. Um, so we can be praying for that family of, of, of who John Castles was working with and praying for John and, and just this ministry of, of working to get these girls out of human trafficking and, and, and working to help them have a relationship with Jesus as well. But let's just lift these things up in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning, for this opportunity just to get together, Lord, to get into your word, to look at this idea of of faith or fear, Lord, and what our response should be as Christians right now. Lord, I'm I'm thinking of all the parents who must be quite discouraged that schools are not going to be reopening until the fall. Lord, that you would give them strength, that you would give them encouragement, Lord. It can be exhausting working and doing your kids' education, but Lord, that you would give them strength. As well, I want to be lifting up Art and Willie Mitchell as they're just so hoping to see their son Andrew on Father's Day. Lord, that you would ease these restrictions on Andrew, that he would be able to see his parents. And Lord, I also want to just be lifting up, um, I, I just want to be lifting up John Castle's God. Lord, that you would be with him during this incredibly difficult time, Lord, as he ministers to these women. And Lord, there's such heartbreak and heart-wrenching, Lord. And I, I think especially of this young woman who was murdered. Oh, Lord, I can't imagine what her family is going through. That you would comfort them, God. That you would give them strength. And that you would give John strength, Lord, to continue in this ministry. Lord, be with this morning. Be with us this morning as we get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please welcome our guest speaker, Pastor Laird Crump, as we look at faith or fear. Although I try to be an optimistic and a glass half full kind of guy, I'm wondering if you would just give me a few moments to vent this morning. I don't know if you're feeling this, but I kind of feel that our world is in a real mess right now. And I'm starting to get very concerned and worried, and actually I'm starting to get quite fearful about the future. And as I just say these words, I'm, I'm sure some of you are feeling the same way. You know, there, there are times I must admit that I think maybe we're living in the last, uh, the last days, the last part of the last days, and maybe Jesus will return soon, and oh, that would be wonderful if he would. But, um, you know, it seems that things are, are getting to a bit of a crisis point. And when you read passages like 2 Timothy 3, you get that feeling. Just listen to this. This is uh, Paul, the church leader, speaking about the last days. He says, but mark this, which is kind of interesting. Mark this, he says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, 
lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then Paul says, have nothing to do with such people. And just when you read that scripture, boy, it sounds like a pretty good description of 2020, don't you think? And while I'm venting just a little bit more, can I just say this to you? Uh, I'm really getting sick of COVID, and, and I'm sure that you are as well. And certainly it is so sad to see all of the families that have had loved ones die because of this virus. And it looks like a terrible way to die. But having to go through that kind of pain and suffering in isolation is just so sad. Uh, I mean, it's just such a heavy thing to think about what's happening in our world right now. And, you know, I don't like wearing masks because you, you don't like wearing masks. And I'm sh frustrated with some of the shutdowns of certain businesses. But so far, no one in our family or no one in our church family um, has caught this deadly virus. And for that, I am truly, truly thankful. But I must admit, I am also afraid, fearful, of how the enemy of our souls is using this pandemic to cause the church to stall out and lose a passion for its purpose. And when I look at Christians today, I see an overwhelming and pervading sense of fear rather than faith. Now, now don't get me wrong, I, I'm thankful that we can still meet virtually and that we're starting to get back on track with in-person services and those kinds of things. But um, what's concerning to me is that the church is built around relationships. Uh, we call that biblical community. And we know that nothing grows well in isolation, including the church, including Christians. God has designed the church to be relational. And we're being threatened in that area right now. You know, as, as you know, we're described in Scripture as a flock and a family and as a body. Those are three metaphors used for the church in, in the Bible. And those metaphors don't seem to really fit well these days, do they? Right now, you know, the flock is scattered, the family is fragmented, and the body is ailing. And this really scares me and concerns me. It's one of those things that causes me to lay awake at night. <clears throat> and I sometimes wonder if the devil is wringing his hands with delight these days as he watches the church of God retreat and tremble in fear. And I wonder if he's thrilled with how anxious so many Christians seems to be today. And when our panic meter rises, I think his delight increases. And he has many Christians running scared these days. Yet, you know, in the midst of all of this, I need to remember that I am a child of God. And you are a child of God. But at times, some of us are living fear-based lives rather than faith-based lives. And our fears are varied. I just shared a few of mine that are maybe a little bit more vocational and church-related here, but we all have a pile of fears that in many ways are driving our life, driving our decisions, controlling our emotions. So I ask you as I ask myself, during these crazy days, are you more fear-based or faith-based? Are you living in fear or are you living by faith? Are you retreating into fear rather than advancing forward in faith in your life? Now, of course, faith doesn't mean that we're not cautious and not responsible. I'm not talking about being irresponsible. But can I, can I just continue to vent just for a few more moments? Um, thanks for listening. Um, you know, let me just elaborate a little bit on my fear as a pastor. Because I'm 
very concerned about the implications of, of this fearfulness on the health and well-being of the church. Church growth experts are predicting that most churches will lose about 30% of their membership, and many churches will close their doors for good. And this is, let me just come back and just say that this is not just nominal people who might be attend church once or twice a year. These would be Christians who have been attending for a while, but with this delay of Christian activity, they have just stopped engaging with God. And that is very scary. And I think that this is not only because of COVID, but also because we as God's people tend to be giving in to our fears and walking away from the priorities of God's church. Many people have put seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness on the back burner of their lives. And fear makes one do that. We go into survival mode and we just uh, hunker down. As you know, it only takes about three weeks to develop a habit or break a habit. And we've been out of habit now as a church for over seven months. And I shudder to think of the long-term implications of this on the health uh, of churches, our church and other churches. And I shudder to think of the implications of that on communities in terms of reaching them for Christ. And I wonder if the quality of our commitment to Jesus and his mission has waned greatly in the last several months because of our fear. I know that God can still use Zoom and FaceTime and print, uh, and we're thankful for all of those kinds of things, but discipleship was meant to be carried out life on life, not necessarily screen to screen. Now, these are some of the realities that we're dealing with these days, and I, I want to assure you that our site leadership teams and our church board are thinking aggressively on these things of how do we continue the mission of God with some of these new realities that we're facing here. But I think you'd agree with me that even beyond this, there, there's been so many crazy things happening in our world these days. You know, with fist fights among East Coast fishermen. I mean, go figure that one. Or fentanyl deaths on the West Coast. Or financial insecurity and racial divide, uh, not to mention all of those crazy things that are happening south of the border right now. And you probably have a lot of fears that are buzzing around, around your brain right now. And I have some of those as well. And right now I'm wondering if you could think of two or three things that are really pressing, that are really quite scary for you, really quite concerning for you right now. Can you pull two or three of those things up to the forefront of your mind right now? You know, my guess is I don't have to give you too much time to do that because you can probably get those up there pretty quick. Concerned about my job, my kids, my marriage, you know, my, my financial security. I'm, I'm concerned about my, my elderly parent who's in a long-term care facility. There's all of these things that are, are captivating our minds. But it's precisely in these times of chaos that our faith needs to exceed our fear. Does yours does mine. You know, the Word of God calls us to be faith-based, not fear-based, even in the midst of chaotic times. You know, in the Old Testament days of the prophet Isaiah, all hell was breaking loose around Israel. And in that chaos, listen to what God said to them. In Isaiah chapter 41, this is what God says to his people. Listen carefully. He says, <clears throat> I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord 
your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. As I've had the privilege of reflecting on this passage from Isaiah 41 and reading commentaries on this portion of Scripture throughout the week, here's what I have learned from some others that are much wiser than I am. And in these few verses, there are two statements from God, two commands, and then five reasons why we are to live by faith and not to be living by fear. So let's take a look at those two statements as we just unpack this passage of Scripture a little bit here. Look at what God says to his people, and he says to us now, this applies to us today too. First statement he makes is this, I have chosen you, God says, I've chosen you. And certainly this was true of Israel. They knew that they were God's chosen people. But at that time in history, I don't think they felt that way. They were actually in captivity. They were slaves at that time. But God lovingly reminds them that he does have a plan for them because he has chosen them to be his people. In fact, as another prophet said to Israel at another time from Jeremiah 29, he said, uh, quoting God, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And essentially, God is saying, he's saying, I've got this. I've got this because I've got you. I've got you. And amidst the chaos, Israel is needed to be reminded that they were chosen by God. And I wonder right now, as we're facing a really messed up world and all sorts of fears in our own minds and hearts, I wonder if that is a good reminder for us today. For we too are chosen by God. We too are His people. You know, in the New Testament, Peter reminds us this by saying this. He says, you are a chosen people. He's speaking to Christians. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but you know what? Now you are the people of God. Once you would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. The love God had and has for Israel is the same love that he has for you and for me. That's the first statement. Look at the second statement. God says, I've chosen you. And then secondly, he says, I've, I have not rejected you. I have not rejected you. I have not abandoned you. And what an important word of affirmation to hear, especially during these times we're in. You know, often when we're going through hard times, we feel maybe God's really ticked off with me and he's punishing me for something. Or, or maybe he's just abandoned. He's, he's, he's like an absent father who's just kind of taken off and left us on our own. And I know many of you have been asking, why is God allowing all of this bad stuff to be happening? And it's certainly a very natural question. We sometimes feel that God doesn't care about us, but look at what God is saying here in his word, the Bible. He says, I have not rejected you. I have not abandoned you. I am here. In Hebrews 13, in the New Testament, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And if you've got your Bible there, underline the word never right now. Do that. If you're using your device, highlight it somehow. What does the word never mean? It means this, at no time in the past or in the future, on no occasion, not ever, will God leave us or forsake us. And God's silence or our confusion with him does not in any way, shape, or form mean that he has rejected us or abandoned us. Don't believe those lies. So here God begins this passage with two statements. I've chosen you. I have not rejected you. And then he gives us two commands in light of that. The first one is this. He says, in light of this, do not fear. 
You know, fear is the emotion that comes into our hearts when we believe that something or someone is dangerous and likely to cause us a lot of pain. And anything dangerous or threatening that's happening to us causes fear to happen. And of course, we think these days, like fear is lurking around every corner. And again, what are those deep concerns that you have? Or let me ask you this, what worst case scenarios are being played out in your mind over and over again? Do you ever do that? I sometimes do. And God is saying to you today through his word, do not fear. Let go of those concerns. Stop playing out worst case scenarios in your mind. God has chosen you. God has not rejected you. So do not fear. And by the way, can I point out the obvious here that this is not a request. This is actually a command. The second command he gives us, though, is similar to that. He says, do not be dismayed. And what does it mean to be dismayed? I, I think to be dismayed means to be anxious when you look all around you. You look all around and immediately things are alerting you and causing you to become upset. Have you ever found yourself doing that these days? Uh, you're looking at all of the craziness and, and feeling these waves of anxiety crashing over your soul. I mean, just watch any news program these days, and by the end of it, you're feeling overwhelmed. I mean, you just want to go to some silly sitcom just to kind of get those thoughts out of your head. Or how about even just looking a little closer to home, how about looking at what's going on in your family these days? Got any stressors there? My guess is you do. Who, I mean, who doesn't? Now, I know what some of you are thinking here. You're probably thinking, well, it's easy for God to say this, but my life is full of stress and anxiety. You know, there are so many threats and worries and anxieties all around us these days that it almost seems unfair that God says, don't fear. You know, don't be dismayed. Don't be anxious about these. It almost seems unfair. I mean, these times seem to be unprecedented in our experience. And these are the worst of times we've probably seen in our lifetime, right? Uh, and you might be right. I might be right. You know, I've lived a pretty long time now, and when I see the complexity of the issues that are facing us today, politically, socially, certainly spiritually, in terms of families, in terms of, of, of the financial world and, world and vocations, all of those kinds of things, when I look at these things, they do seem unprecedented to me. But you know, when these words were given to the people of Israel, they too were going through some very, very difficult times. And to be honest, much more difficult than the troubles we're going through today. At that time in history, Cyrus the Great and his armies were marching through the, the whole region of the Middle East and every one of those little nations was living in fear, fear of being obliterated by him. And to make matters worse, Israel was in captivity in Babylon at that time which is bad enough, but they were afraid of, of being caught in the crossfire of all of this and going from the frying pan into the fire. They had no means to defend themselves. They were slaves. So you can imagine their anxiety of this ominous army coming any day now to rape, pillage, and burn. And when you look at that context, it, it makes our current day problems look a little bit like a cakewalk. You know, Israel had no way to defend themselves. Fear and being dismayed was minute by minute in their experience. But interestingly, unbeknownst to them, God was going to use Cyrus the Great to break Babylon's hold on Israel. And it's in that context that God speaks these words to his people. And because, again, we too are the people of God, these words from the Bible apply to us today, to Christians of any era, when they're going through difficult, challenging times. We can be assured that God is going to be constantly, consistently watching over his people. We might not understand it all this side of heaven. Most of it we won't, quite frankly. But behind the chaos, we need to live by faith, not fear. Behind the chaos, we need to have faith that God is doing something profound 
and hold on tight to that faith. Now, you know, God is aware of our propensity to worry. God is aware of our propensity to be dismayed and anxious about all sorts of things. So in this passage, he adds some reasons why we can let go of our fear and embrace a life of faith. And he gives five reasons here in this passage. Uh, reason number one would be this. He says, do not fear. Why? For I'm with you. I'm with you. How can we be faith-based rather than fear-based when circumstances are scaring us? We remember that whatever we're facing, God is with us. He is right there with us. You know, I remember going through a very difficult challenge in my life, and uh, I had to walk into a, a situation that was filled with anxiety and fear for me. And uh, I was sharing it with a good friend of mine named Kevin, and he said, you know what, Laird? I'm coming with you. He, he didn't ask me, can I come? Do you want me to come? Do you want me to support you? He didn't say anything. He said, I'm going with you. And what a difference that made for me, knowing I was not alone. And it's amazing what we can get through when we know someone is with us. And the amazing reality for God's people is that we are never alone. Never alone. God is always with us. And we need to see his presence with the eyes of faith. He's with us in that doctor's office. And some of you have been spending a lot of time there recently. He's with us in that courtroom. He's with us in that classroom. He's with your loved ones in that long-term care facility. God's with you in your living room. He's in your kitchen. God is with you even in your car. And that's a scary thought, isn't it? The way I drive. But God says to you, do not fear. Like, I'm, I'm here. I'm right with you. He's not going anywhere. He is with us. And when we see with the eyes of faith, the reality of his constant presence changes everything. But he gives a second reason. He says, do not, do not be dismayed. Why? For I am your God. I'm your God. How can we be faith-based rather than fear-based when anxiety is sweeping all over us? When we realize that we belong to God and God belongs to us. Isn't that wonderful to think about? You know, if you've invited Jesus Christ into your life, you can claim that he is your God. And for every true Christian, God says, I'm your God. I'm for you. I'm not against you. He is ours and we are his. Do you own that truth? Are you walking in that truth? Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, in my younger days, when I was a youth pastor, I also led a lot of worship. I'm a guitarist and I sing half decently kind of thing. And I remember being asked by Youth for Christ, um, now Youth Unlimited, but Youth for Christ back then, to lead worship in a large youth rally of about three or four hundred kids. And um, I recruited some of the guys from our church and, and our band, and we rehearsed. And one of the guys wanted to, he said, I got this new song that I've, I've written, put together. It's just a simple little thing. Could we sing it? And I was thinking, oh boy, I don't know if we could. And uh, I said, well, sing it for me. And he says, it goes like this. <clears throat> I am yours. You are mine. I'm the cup, Lord, pour out your wine. I'm the candle, Lord, and you make me shine. I am yours, you are mine. And, you know, I must admit, I thought, that's kind of like Moon June Spoon, kind of like the rhymes aren't terribly complicated there, you know, but, but I said, okay, Bill, you know, we can, we can sing this one, you know. So I remember up there with my guitar leading all these kids and say, we just want to do this little chorus and just sing it a couple of times and just be aware that we belong to God. And we taught it to them, and the whole crowd started to sing. I am yours, you are mine. I'm the cup, Lord, pour out your wine. I'm the candle, Lord, and you make me shine. I am yours, you are mine. And the amazing thing about this, as we're leading these students in worship, um, 
I cut out the guitar and they just kept singing that over and over again. It went on, it was just a little song, but it went on for, for many minutes here. And that truth was hitting home to all of these students. And it was an incredibly moving moment when all of these students realized, man, God is my God. I am his, he is mine. How profound that is. And I hope that that's a truth from God's word that can really penetrate your heart of fear even today. God goes on and he gives a third reason here in this passage. He says, uh, I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. I'll give you the strength you need. So how can we be faith-based rather than fear-based when we feel so weak and when we feel so small? Well, with the eyes of faith, we need to know that God is there to strengthen us. And I find it interesting in this passage, God refers to Israel as a worm. And that's not to be a degrading term, but rather this speaks to their lowly nature and weakness compared to his strength. And then he refers to his people as little Israel. Oh, little Israel. You know, all of us have weaknesses, and sometimes those weaknesses are what causes us to be fearful and dismayed. But God says, I know you're weak. I know you're weak, my little one. Don't think you're stronger than you are. And it's okay, God says, it's okay for you to be weak right now. Because I'm strong, and I will give you the strength you need moment by moment, day by day. And you know, if you've been walking with God for a while, you can surely attest to this. God gives you his strength day to day to get through the hardship you're facing. He doesn't give you the strength for a week from now, but as you need it, he gives you the strength to get through some of those struggles. And we may feel like a coward, but he can give us his courage. Fourth reason God gives in this passage as to why we can live by faith and not by fear. He says, I will help you. I will help you. How can we be faith-based rather than fear-based in our lives when we feel overwhelmed and loaded with pressures? God says, I will help you. Last weekend, I was doing some heavy chores on our property. I was actually shoveling two yards of gravel out of my tuck, truck onto a pathway there. And my daughter and son-in-law drove in, and Josiah, my son-in-law, um, came up to me and said, just, he said, said three words, said, need some help? And those three words really encouraged me. And I said, yeah, I do, actually, please. Can you grab that rake and can you grab that shovel? And, and the two of us got to work doing that. And you know, when we're going through some really difficult times, some hard stuff, let's remember that God is there saying, need some help? Need some help? He is there to help us. So let's ask him and see how he does bring help to our lives. Say, Lord, I need some help. Could you please help me? And we might want to ask the question, how does God help us during stressful times? You know, sometimes the, the help he gives us in how, is in how he has wired us, the internal strength that he actually has given us, and we're actually able to do a lot more than we think we can. Um, he's given us certain giftings and talents, backgrounds. Sometimes he helps us by bringing other people into our lives who practically help us. He often works through other people. Sometimes he helps by altering our circumstances a little bit. You know, if we give in to fear, we'll be oblivious to the ways in which God might actually be trying to offer his help. But as we open up our eyes of faith, we see that he's actually altering circumstances behind the scenes. And have you ever found this to be true? It's amazing when we have faith in God how many coincidences seem to happen? Have you noticed that? Often though, more often than not, God helps us through his truth, truth of the word of God, the Bible. To subdue our fears and to open the eyes of our heart, we need to be embracing God's truth and not the lies or the half lies of our culture. You know, I can't think of a more desperate time for Canadian Christians 
to understand and really embrace God's truth. It's the truth that helps us. It's the truth of God that sets us free from our fear. And you know, as history is being written, I'm not sure we're going to be known as a generation that was biblically deep. You know, as Jesus followers, we need to be immersed in the Bible and not just having a quick fix little devotional here and there, but we really need to dig deep and understand God's truth. In, in the Bible, that's where he informs us of what is right, what is wrong, what is worth giving up, what is worth holding on to. You know, how does God help us? My goodness, he's given us 66 books of the Bible to, to help us. It's God's owner's manual, so to speak, for, for us as human beings. And in that book, he calls us to align our lives with his truth. And when we are seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, then a lot of things just seem to fall into place. Just as an aside, let me just ask you, how are you doing in terms of studying the Bible these days? Uh, is it a joy or is it a hardship? Are you, are you able to go deep? Boy, if any of you are interested in receiving a little bit of help, I know any one of us as pastors would love to, to just share a few methods and ideas about how to study the Bible more effectively. Don't even hesitate to email us and say, can you give me some help studying the Bible? We would jump at that opportunity to help you. Well, let's look at the fifth reason God says don't fear, don't be dismayed. He says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand. How can we be faith-based rather than fear-based in the middle of chaos? By understanding God is holding our hand. He is propping us up. You know, when I think of this imagery, uh, two pictures come to my mind. One is of a young child who maybe needs help climbing the stairs. And the parent takes the, the sibling's hand and puts another hand on the elbow and just supports them as they, they walk, uh, keeping them from falling. Uh, the other picture I have in my mind is of an elderly person who's a little shaky. Do you have any old folks in your life besides me? who might be a little shaky. You know, I remember as my mother got older, when walking with her, I, uh, I frequently had to, to grab her hand and put my other hand on her elbow. And uh, on her own, she couldn't walk well, would be quite tipsy. But as I supported her and just walked along with her, we could have a delightful walk together and a wonderful talk. And similarly, in our weakness, God is there to hold us up, to prop us up with his righteous right hand. And if you're young or if you're old, boy, that truth is comforting, isn't it? You know, are you able to see his hand propping you up, holding your hand through the difficulties that you're going through right now? Can you see his hand through the eyes of faith? You know, if you've been knocked down in any way, and maybe you feel, boy, I'm just, I'm just knocked down right now and I'm ready to be knocked out. Please see that God's reaching out his hand to you and wanting to pull you back up and give you the support that you need. Okay. How do we apply this passage from God's word to our lives on Monday morning? What difference will this truth make to us as we're facing fears next Friday? Well, a good way to remember this is to use the, the palm of your hand and the fingers on your hand as, as a bit of an object lesson here. And this is just something that I have found to be helpful here. When feeling fearful or dismayed or upset this week, point to the center of your palm and tap it twice. And as you do, say out loud, God has chosen me. God has not rejected me. And then with your fingers declare, God is with me. God is my God. God will give me the strength I need. God will help me get through what I'm facing. God is holding my hand. And then hold on tight to that hand of truth. So let me just ask you today, what are those fears you're carrying? I asked you to identify two or three 
earlier. What's causing you to be fearful? What's causing you to be dismayed? Let me try to guess how some of you might have responded to that question. My guess is some of you are saying, oh man, job security? I don't even know what that is. And you know, I, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job or I have lost my job and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. God has chosen me. God has not rejected me. God is with me. God is my God. God will give me the strength I need. God will help me get through what I'm facing. God is holding my hand. Or maybe you're having some real tension in your marriage these days. It's kind of funny that with more isolation, more couples are fighting. But even at the best of times, couples have some struggles. And you could go through the same thing. Maybe you've been, been just beating your head against the wall and you, you're arguing about the same things over and over and over again and you're, you're fearful that your marriage is going to make it. Well, think about that and prayerfully say, wait a minute, God has chosen me. God has not rejected me. God is with me. God is my God. God will give me the strength that I need. God will help me get through what I'm facing. God is holding my hand. That's how we be faith-based rather than fear-based in our, in our world. We can do the same with our kids. And boy, our kids can bring some wonderful joy into our lives. They can bring a lot of pain too, a lot of worry, a lot of fear. Um, you know, when you think in a macro kind of way, I'm very concerned about the unraveling of our country. And, and sometimes I am dismayed over the lack of joy and hope that our young people have these days. And in feeling those fears, I can say, wait a minute, God has chosen me. He's not rejected me. He's with me. He's not going anywhere. He is my God. He will give me the strength I need. He will help me get through what I'm facing. God is holding my hand. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. COVID. Boy, we've got a lot of fear around that, don't we? Um, boy, a lot of, lot of fear. Some of it is founded. Frankly, some of it is not. But we, many of us, are consumed with fearfulness over this. Do you remember when the pandemic first hit and going grocery shopping? I mean, I was the most rude guy ever. I wouldn't make eye contact with anybody. You know, I was just trying to keep them to my own and grabbing what I needed at the grocery store and, you know, just filled with fear. Now I realize that with proper protocols, it, it's totally fine. I can go shopping and, and I don't need to be as fearful. But back then I was very fearful over COVID. Or think about this even in terms of the fear of coming back and physically meeting with God's people in a church setting, whether that's a small group, a class, or a worship service. You know, frankly, that's a fear that many people have. Uh, I've learned personally that I'm a lot safer in our church building, in a church service, than I am at Walmart or Home Depot when I go shopping there on the weekends. But still, some of you maybe are filled with fear, and my guess is you're paying the price spiritually for that. Because again, faith does not grow well in isolation. So over the whole COVID situation, and even your fear of getting back into some regular routines of church life, as you're living by faith rather than fear, say, God has chosen me, God has not rejected me. God is with me. God is my God. God will give me the strength I need. God will help me get through what I'm facing. God is holding my hand. I know some of you are going through some real medical problems. It's, it's um, Boy, just insult to injury right now that there's many of our congregation that are going through a very difficult time. Please pray for them. You don't need to know all of their names, but we've got several people wrestling with cancer and, and all sorts of other issues there. Um, uh, many of you are struggling with mental health issues. Uh, you know, we've had some in our congregation experience the death of a loved one. 
And just think about that when someone close to you has passed away and you are filled with fear and you're feeling all alone. You need to take this truth of God's word and say, wait a minute, God has chosen me. God has not rejected me. God is with me. God is my God. God will give me the help or the strength I need. God will help me get through whatever I'm facing. God is holding my hand and hold on tight with the eyes of faith. God is saying to you, to me, to all of us today, I've chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm little Jacob, little, or you worm Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Thank you for joining us this morning. And, and I want to thank our guest speaker, Pastor Laird Crump, for that just great word on fear or faith. And thank you for watching with us this morning. If you would like to get in touch or involved in any of the ministries that are going on in the church, or in particular, if you are interested in joining one of these fellowship groups that are going to be opening in the next couple of weeks, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you and I would love to get you involved. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you for joining us.